Well, Northern Ireland has been uh, fascinating in the last few days because the leader of the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, it's the biggest pro-union, biggest unionist party, and its leader, Geoffrey Donaldson, has been an MP for Lagan Valley, uh, that's his constituency outside Belfast, since 1997. There aren't too many MPs in Parliament who've been there since 1997. Well, massive political earthquake because on a Thursday he was arrested alongside a 57-year-old woman. They have now been charged with 10 offences, including, in Geoffrey Donaldson's case, rape. And that has meant that he has resigned, of course, as leader of the D DUP. He's still an MP. He's been suspended by his party, so he's now an independent MP as well. Uh, we're, we'll talk a bit, of course, about the uh, charges against him, but this is an active court proceeding, so we need to be really, really careful about that. And actually, the police have said to people to stop speculating online about this because the last thing uh, anybody should do, and of course it's illegal, would be to prejudice a court case. But there are massive political ramifications as well uh, for this. No better person to talk to than Amanda Ferguson, who is a journalist in Northern Ireland. Amanda, thank you for joining us this afternoon on Talk TV. What an incredibly interesting uh, very difficult, of course, uh, but also seismic events, both politically and indeed uh, legally in Northern Ireland. I want to get into the politics in a second, but I just want you to take us through what we can say about what has happened to Geoffrey Donaldson over the past uh, few days legally. Tell us, tell us what uh, what's the, the latest we know on those charges and what has happened. OK, well, uh, we know that uh, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson and another um, were arrested, that uh, they face charges that are part of a, a live investigation for police and an ongoing uh, criminal justice uh, process. So Sir Geoffrey Donaldson um, sent a letter to the DUP telling them that he was resigning as party leader uh, because of these historical um, charges that he is facing. And he was immediately suspended then as a DUP member. Now, we uh, know that uh, Gavin Robinson uh, was then unanimously uh, made uh, interim party leader. Um, he's interested in leadership enough that he's been the deputy leader of the party up until this point. He's been the deputy for um, not even a year. And uh, what happens next uh, remains to be seen. We know that uh, the the court case um, that uh, will be involved in uh, Sir Geoffrey is going to have its first hearing uh, next month. And in the meantime, uh, political um, actors from across the spectrum in Northern Ireland are really trying to focus in on um, keeping Stormont functioning. You know, obviously this is something that is a big earthquake for the DUP. You could tell from Gavin Robinson's interview yesterday that he was in shock at the at the revelations and at the um, allegations. And there's there's a, there's much uh, to flow from this we, next. We actually look at a little bit of that interview that was with the senior Ireland correspondent of Sky News, David Blevins. Let's see what Gavin Robinson, now this guy is also a member of Parliament, he's the MP for East Belfast. He was the deputy leader of the DUP until yesterday, he's now its interim leader. Uh, fascinating interview, we're just going to play about a minute of this just to get a flavour of how Gavin Robinson has been reacting to that news about his former party colleague Geoffrey Donaldson. Let's play this clip. I think it's been a devastating revelation and has caused tremendous shock, not just for myself personally or my colleagues within the DUP, but for the community right across Northern Ireland, it came as a great shock. Um, but we are a party and individuals that believe in justice. We have faith in our criminal justice system. Uh, and so in the coming days and months, I think it is important that none of us say anything or act in any way uh, that would seek to prejudice what is now an ongoing criminal investigation. Very late last night, uh, the party became aware um, whenever it was revealed uh, publicly that there had been an individual uh, and another charged um, and it became clear to us who that individual was. Um, in the early hours of this morning, we took steps to make sure we could bring colleagues together, uh, discuss what it was uh, we had learned uh, and take the appropriate steps uh, that we could, uh, as you know, um, Jeffrey Donaldson has stepped down as party leader. Um, he has indicated that to us, but through our disciplinary process, we similarly had to take uh, the steps to suspend him from party membership until the conclusion uh, of what is now a live criminal investigation. 
That is Gavin Robinson, the interim leader of the DUP, talking there. He, when he was referring to yesterday, of course, he was referring to Thursday because that interview was recorded yesterday. I want to get into the politics in a minute, Amanda, but, of course, the PSNI police service in Northern Ireland has been saying that people should... I mean, there's so much speculation online. We're obviously not going to get into that for legal reasons, but already a warning, not just from the police service in Northern Ireland, but from Gavin Robinson in that as well, not to prejudice that, that court case. Yeah, I think that's hugely important. Obviously, a complainant in a case such as this is entitled uh, to anonymity. And uh, the, there's been a frenzied online commentary um, since the revelations came into the public domain. I think people are, are losing track of days here because it's been a, a real whirlwind. Obviously, there are people's lives at the centre of this, um, but the, the focus should be on uh, protecting the integrity of a live police investigation and a criminal justice process. And of course, um, as political journalists, we can pick over the detail of what it means for the DUP. Well, well let's, let's do that right now, um, Amanda. Um, Gavin Robinson is the interim leader. They'll, there will now presumably be a leadership election for the DUP, a very fractious one, uh, two actually leadership elections uh, just about two and a half years ago. Um, what do you think will happen now? Because there is a sort of Jeffrey Donaldson wing, isn't there? Uh, he brought people through the problems in regard to the protocol, the uh, the Windsor framework, for example, took sort of a leap of faith. It was called Jeffrey's deal to get, uh, go to get government back up and running in Northern Ireland, although he remained at Westminster as a DUP MP. Uh, but could that could that uh, perhaps be at risk now in regard to Northern Ireland's government? And what do you think will happen? And who do you think will run in regard to the DUP leadership, Amanda? I think that it, that it could be. Obviously, whenever the Stormont was restored, it was Jeffrey's deal. The party officers weren't unanimous in wanting to go back to Stormont. So I think Gavin Robinson wants to try to stabilise the party. However, there may be opponents of the Windsor framework and the post-Brexit trading arrangements who make a power play for leadership. Uh, it depends uh, what the DUP want to do. Do they want another contest? Do they want to provide continuity uh, in Gavin Robinson, a continuation uh, of government? And I also think that it, it sort of weakens the, the first the deputy first minister's position a little bit in that Emma Little Pengelly was very much seen as Jeffrey's pick uh, for deputy first minister. She's obviously an unelected uh, MLA. What happens that, internally? That, 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 I think a lot of viewers and listeners in England, Scotland, and Wales will find that quite weird. So just to clarify, we uh, we were in a situation where Jeffrey Donaldson ran. Stop me if I'm wrong here, Amanda. Uh, ran for to be an assembly member in Lagan Valley, the constituency where he was and indeed still is an MP, was elected as an assembly member for the Northern Ireland Assembly, immediately stood down, gave it to someone else, uh, who's Emma Little Pengelly, who previously has been uh, a, an MP and an assembly member, and she's been uh, a special advisor and so on, well qualified, but nonetheless unelected. And now she is the joint leader of Northern Ireland. Yeah, that, you know that that that's right, Peter. I know that's something that hasn't sat comfortably. It's within the rules um, to be able to co-opt someone into a seat, and they don't have to be an elected person. Uh, but I just think that her position is a little uh, bit vulnerable in the context that we're dealing with. Because Obviously, it's so linked to Jeffrey Donaldson, as I suppose Gavin Robinson would be someone, the interim leader, very much a a, a fan and friend of Jeffrey Donaldson politically, anyway. Although things have changed dramatically in the last little while. I, I mean, how do you think that leadership election will go? Amanda. Yeah, well, obviously, Gavin Robinson was someone that, that led Sir Jeffrey Donaldson's leadership campaign. So they, they are on the same wing of the DUP as such. Uh, what happens on the other side of things remains to be seen. It'll be interesting if we perhaps hear from Lord Dodds, if we hear from Sammy Wilson, if we hear from um, some other senior figures who so far haven't really said anything, perhaps for obvious reasons. But that isn't going to be a position uh, that's going to be tenable in the time ahead. I think the DUP will welcome the fact that this is the Easter weekend and it gives Gavin Robinson Robinson uh, and the party officers time to regroup and work out exactly what's going to happen next. But you have heard from the other political parties in Northern Ireland that they want just the continuation and continuity of government, which has only been back for you know a number of weeks. Uh, and I'd imagine after the Easter uh, recess that we'll probably see a flurry of legislation starting to be introduced. Yeah, it's interesting actually on that because, uh, of course, sta stable stable devolution in Northern Ireland is certainly what the majority of people want to happen. Although tomorrow actually we're talking about devolution and whether it actually works. We're going to have a whole debate on that, including with voices from Northern Ireland. But I wonder about the impact on unionism more broadly because Geoffrey Donaldson didn't just lead the DUP. He was the leader of unionism more broadly. Of course, he was originally a member of the Ulster Unionist Party many years ago before falling out and leaving that party. But, I, I mean, there are implications 
tensions there in terms of the union itself with huge and growing calls for referendums on both sides of the border. If Mary Lou Macdonald, the president of Sinn Féin, becomes Taoiseach, uh, the Prime Minister of Ireland, there may well be some sort of referendum removed towards it there, perhaps. I mean, this is this is not just about political events. This is uh, in terms of Northern Ireland per se, but this more broadly could be seen about the union as well. Oh, it definitely is. You know, the political landscape across the island of Ireland uh, is changing, as you've just reflected in your remarks. And for unionism, it's in a difficult position. It's not in a dominant uh, era of unionism. Everyone knows that Northern Ireland was created with an inbuilt unionist majority. The Sinn Féin emerging as the largest party wasn't something that people thought was was going to happen, but it has happened. Um, and the the idea that, you know, power sharing, um, you know, is still a good model. I think most people would agree with that. And there has been support uh, for the parties to head back to Stormont. But it's been a very um, fractured system of government that uh, it's been a stop-start system of government because it's a mandatory coalition and you're having people who are kind of diametrically opposed on most issues having to, to work together to try and deliver for people who want different outcomes. Now, the political conversations around Irish reunification and maintenance um, of the union have accelerated post-Brexit and that's something that's likely to continue uh, in the years ahead. So unionism doesn't have a majority majority anymore and um, it's it's gone through uh, various sort of difficult uh, years and really the focus should be now for unionist leaders to really think about how they can sell the benefits of the union because I'm I'm not sure that unionist leaders have always been very good at reaching outside of unionism to appeal beyond its own base because it's something that they've never had to do before but we're in an era now and to put it really crudely the demographics show that they're going to have to do that. But that's fascinating as well, Amanda, isn't it? And maybe you would paint a picture. When I'm talking about this, I'm chief political uh, commentator of the station as well. What I always try to say when people think of Northern Ireland, the old way, maybe you'll agree with this, maybe you won't, the old way of looking at it was just straightforwardly unionist versus nationalist Republican, uh, just two sides, essentially. Now there are three because the others are a lot more as well. The Alliance Party, the Centrist Party, doing much better than it did a lot of younger people who don't have particularly strong views on the union per se. And actually, with both unionism and nationalism in a minority, it's those in the middle, those on the other side, that would be convinced by lots of different things moving in different directions. And for many people, Geoffrey Donaldson, to some of those others, was seen as someone who was perhaps perhaps seen as a little bit more reasonable, maybe, than people like the Firebrand Ian Paisley or even his successor, Peter Robinson. But I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about those those others, where they come from, who they vote for, and really the fate of Northern Ireland in terms of the union could be in their hands, couldn't it? Yeah, well, you know, we know that Alliance has had an electoral presence for over 50 years, but it certainly emerged as the third major electoral force after the 2022 uh, Assembly election. The the challenge that you have in, in, in analysing a cross-community party that doesn't take a fixed constitutional position is that if you're, you know, dividing us up into who's who, roughly 40% unionist, roughly 40% Irish Republican, and then 20% of these others who vote for Alliance or vote for the Greens party or, or vote for other um, independent candidates but within uh, that cohort you will have people who are British unionist minded people who are Irish Republican minded you'll have some people who don't really uh, care or aren't that fussed on the constitutional question or who could be persuaded either way so they're going to be very important whenever a border poll is eventually call called in Northern Ireland obviously the the Good Friday Agreement um, settled uh, the sort of constitutional question for a while in that for the first time uh, people accepted that Northern Ireland was part of the United Kingdom, but it is a conditional part of the United Kingdom for as long as people want it to be. So the union is maintained uh, by democracy. If people don't want that anymore and want to vote for something different, that is up to them. So in the time ahead, that battle uh, will be for that middle ground uh, cohort who people aren't really sure what way they're going to vote. However, recently polling is indicating um, that uh, quite a significant percentage of Alliance voters are in favour uh, of Irish unity either now or at some point in the future. So the unionism has an uphill, uphill battle um, ahead, but regardless of what happens in the future, whether it's a united Ireland or maintaining uh, the union with Britain, we're all still going to have to live here, apart from a few people who might uh, leave the jurisdiction 
transition, everyone's still going to be here with different identities and nobody's going to be forced to be something they're not. But uh, certainly there's uh, turbulent times ahead and perhaps sometimes the, the border pool question can be framed in a way that it's divisive, but democracy shouldn't be viewed as divisive if, if people uh, thoughtfully outline their positions, give people the facts, give people their pitch and offering, and then it's up to the people to decide. And I think really that republicanism and unionism have to accelerate their offer and really um, coherently outline exactly what it is that people are going to be voting for, uh, because it's all to play for at the moment. But the, the sort of trajectory is pointing uh, towards um, the union being in trouble in the years ahead. And in terms of those communicators, I don't want to talk any more about the court case. We'll leave that to one side. But uh, I, th I think, and perhaps you'll disagree, but I think that Jeffrey Donaldson, certainly over his 40 plus years in politics, as someone who worked for Enoch Powell, as someone who was an Ulster Unionist MP, and someone who was the leader of the DUP, was at the very least a, a, a communicator, someone who brought people with him politically, and was a probably at the height of his powers until he was arrested on Thursday morning. I wonder if you agree with that assessment, Amanda. I think that Jeffrey Donaldson, um, as the UP reps go, um, is mild mannered in comparison to some of his colleagues, but he's still a pretty hardline uh, unionist in terms of his policy and the the, the whipping of uh, politicians, uh, you know, for, for particular lines, socially conservative, uh, and so on. I think that the the shock waves of this story um, are most acutely felt, obviously, by the people at the centre of it. But it does have political ramifications because he's an MP. It doesn't mean that Storm is going to collapse overnight. No, nowhere near. Yeah set of circumstances but we are in a turbulent time at a fragile stage in the restoration of Stormont it's only been uh, up you know for a matter of weeks and we're now facing into one of the most significant uh, political uh, stories that has emerged in Northern Ireland in recent years